exercise of the democratic process. I wish to extend congratulations to the Maldives, a sister small island developing state, on their election to the hem of this General Assembly. Know that you will find the Bahamas to be a strong, engaged, and thoughtful partner for the road ahead. We also congratulate Secretary General Guterres on his re-election to a second term and wish him every success. Colleagues, we are meeting at a most extraordinary time. We come here from different corners of the earth with our theme, building resilience through hope, reflecting our shared determination to pivot from crisis to opportunity. These crises are interconnected and multifaceted and need a global response. We must collaborate to end the COVID-19 pandemic and address public health issues. We must cooperate to mitigate the effects of climate change. And access to development financing must be equitable and fair. An inadequate response to these issues will have dire consequences for the global economy. The world has changed enormously since we first learned about the COVID-19 virus. This crisis made abundantly clear what has always been true. We are all in this together. In every country, we have lost loved ones. We have seen our healthcare workers battle bravely. We have contended with disruption, uncertainty, and grief. We have benefited from extraordinary cooperation and achievements in science. But we also had to contend with misinformation and disinformation and insufficient attempts to curb bad actors propagating the same. Bad information has flowed across borders, undermining public health and public trust. The pandemic has been very difficult for countries like mine. We face an extraordinary need for new resources in health and education and housing, just as our economy is contracting dramatically. Our interconnected world means that we only will be safe when all countries including mine, have the tools needed to fight this virus. This requires the equitable distribution of vaccines. That includes distribution to small island developing states who are not manufacturers. Stockpiling for self-preservation is a fallacy. You will only be safe when we are all safe. I wish to thank the government and people of the United States for their donations of vaccines to the Bahamas and the wider Caribbean region. This gift, alongside donations received previously from India, China, Antigua, and Barbuda, and Dominica, will save many Bahamian lives. This is in addition to the ongoing support of PAHO, CAFA, and the COVAX facility and the regional collaboration among CARICOM countries. But this is still not enough. We need more. Our demand for vaccines has significantly outstripped supply. Along with vaccines, it is important that safe treatments and therapeutics are made accessible and de designated as public goods. We need to fortify critical global supply chains and distribution mechanisms so that we can win this battle and be better prepared for the next one. You will only be safe when we are all safe. The Bahamas joins those reiterating the need to fully fund the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator and its COVAX facility. And we reiterate our alignment with CARICOM's call for the continued high-level engagement to urgently address 
equitable access to vaccines. When vaccines are deployed to reduce transmission, everyone is made safer, not just the direct recipient. We can, by doing so, reduce the opportunities for new and more dangerous variants to emerge. This virus is global and requires a global response. Colleagues, even before COVID-19 shut down my country's border, we were dealing with a catastrophic shock to our economy and our country. Two years ago this month, one of the strongest storms ever recorded in the Atlantic caused catastrophic damage to our islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama. Hurricane Dorian was strengthened by waters that were well above average temperatures. The Earth's changing climate means that hurricanes like Dorian linger longer and cause more damage. The devastation caused by this storm is part of our country's landscape. The physical and emotional wreckage are still with us. Recently, I spoke with a woman who lost her husband and her three children in the storm. Every rainfall is a reminder of the horror. How can we continue to do nothing in the face of such tragedy? The very worst thing about Dorian is our sense of foreboding, our sense that this hurricane, which took so much from so many, is only the beginning. None of us believe this is a once-in-a-generation storm. Instead, we know it is a nightmare that could easily reoccur tomorrow, next week, or even next month. To any leader who believes we still have plenty of time to address climate change, I invite you to visit Abaco and Grand Bahama in our country. For island nations such as ours, climate change is here and is a real and present danger. Before Hurricane Dorian in 2019, we faced hurricanes in 2015, 2016, and in 2017. We cannot survive this new, more, no, new normal. The recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report warned that avoiding the worst outcomes requires immediate action. This is, as the Secretary General noted, a code red moment. Thus, we are not here to call for measured steps. We had to say that big and radical change is the only response that can save our country. We are out of time. We stand with the CARICOM countries and small island development states to remind the world that those who are hit hardest by the impact of climate change are the least responsible. Our countries disproportionately bear the burden of the recovery trap in which we attempt to rebuild to the tune of billions, billions we never had even before COVID. Colleagues, in a few short weeks, we will meet in Glasgow, Scotland, the 26th Climate Change Conference cannot be like the 25th, the 25 that preceded it. We cannot pretend that incremental change is sufficient. We cannot set goals we have no intention of meeting. We cannot keep postponing the change we need for countries like mine to survive. If we are the serious leaders these times require, we must raise our ambitions and make real commitments to cut emissions. We must make real progress on bridging the divides in the investment and access to technology and skills, especially in areas relevant to climate mitigation and adaptation. We must strengthen technical assistance for creating nationally determined contribution commitments along with commensurate implementation financing. We must give teeth and substance to the mechanism for loss and damage, 
if it is to be a meaningful tool for supporting fair recovery and not simply an exercise in defining and highlighting disaster risk. Along with our sister nations in CARICOM, the Bahamas calls for greater climate financing and a need for more engagement and progress on a climate investment platform. And as a matter of priority, more innovative financing and debt solutions are needed, including debt for climate adaptation swaps. We also look forward to the capitalization of a Caribbean Resilience Fund. We also need adequate resourcing and timely access to the Green Climate Fund and the Climate Finance Accelerator. In my just concluded campaign, we call for new renewable energy initiatives in our own country. We are going to build structural and economic resilience in a green recovery with plans to invest in climate smart infrastructure and environmental protection. The Bahamas would lead on wetlands and ocean preservation. And we will seek re-election to the International Maritime Organization. We look forward to the Biodiversity Conference next month. We are committed to the successful conclusion of the negotiations towards an international treaty to conserve marine biodiversity. Colleagues, the compounding impact of economic, environmental, and now public health shocks means that access to affordable finance will be the real driver of progress in the near and long term. The global development financing gap for meeting sustainable development goals by 2030 is estimated in 2019 to be 2.5 trillion. That is only increasing. Today, we reiterate our country's support for the inclusion of a multidimensional vulnerability index in the decision-making of international financial institutions and the international donor community. On a related front, we believe that access to the global financial system and tax cooperation should not be undermined by ad hoc and consistently shifting and arbitrary goalposts and threats of exclusion from the global economy. Financial services is a crucial component of the Bahamian economy. We see an indispensable role for the UN in leveraging its universal jurisdiction for greater oversight of global anti-money laundering the de risking and tax cooperation matters. On a separate note, I wish to convey the Bahamas' rejection of the ongoing economic blockade of our sister Caribbean nation of Cuba. As I conclude, I recall the words of our nation's first prime minister. Sir Lyndon Pindling, as he stood here 48 years ago this month on the occasion of our nation's accession to the United Nations. He spoke about the journey of our people from slavery to colonialism to sovereign independence. He spoke of our country's wish to be neither dominated nor coerced and our wish to build friendships with nations who respected our freedom. He could not have foreseen at that time the challenges we face today with intensifying hurricanes and a deadly virus that has left no nation untouched. But he saw already that no nation is an island unto itself and spoke of the interdependence of all countries. That interdependence has never been clearer. Rest assured, colleagues, that in the Bahamas, you will find a trusted partner committed to moving forward on our collective goals for sustainable development, security, and peace. Thank you.
On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the, and the Minister of Finance of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort his Excellency. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Tonga to introduce and address. And that was the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, Philip Edward Davis, speaking at the UN General Assembly. You can find these and many other stories as always in our website at telesourenglish.net and join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.